Welcome back to the Vince Colony Show. A lot of debate going on right now about where the FBI should set up its headquarters. Even Christopher Wray is alleging that there may be some corruption in the process when Greenbelt, Maryland was chosen over Springfield, Virginia. It's also wild. You have the FBI director even alleging that the place is corrupt. Uh, for more on all of this, I want to bring in a guy who's familiar with these stories. It's Steve Friend. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Renewing America and a former FBI agent, and he joins us on the phone. Steve, thank you so much for this. I'm happy, happy to be here. It, it is wild, isn't it, that you have the FBI director coming out uh, and suggesting that there may have been some corruption in the selection of where to build the new FBI headquarters. Yeah, I, I think so. And then I'm always looking at anything Christopher Ray says with a skeptical eye. And uh, you got to look at the Google Maps. How far is that commute for him to Manassas, where the FBI jet is? Because he loves to abuse his jet privileges and makes a flight of Reagan to pick him up. So mm -hmm. maybe it's some personal self-service there. He just doesn't want to sit in the car as long. Yeah, maybe like like for it to be near his house. Uh, there's a lot of money on the line, obviously, to build uh, an FBI headquarters. We're talking 375 million dollars. Um, you know, in your experience, has the FBI done anything lately to deserve a, a, a shiny new building? No, no. And, and here's something that we need to keep perspective on. There's nothing operational that, that the FBI does at the headquarters building, the, the Hoover building right now. It, it, not having a new building would not impact the, the field any of the good work that we expect from a federal law enforcement perspective. And I think this is a symbolic gesture here. This is Congress signing off on what's going on, which is clearly a, a weaponized FBI that's going after the, their, poli their political enemies, uh, you know, the, their perceived political enemies. And it's definitely a two-tiered system of justice. And, and they are not deserving of a facility that is larger than the Pentagon. Yeah, you know, uh, C Congressman Matt Gates tried to present an amendment recently uh, to defund this FBI headquarters building. He said that he doesn't believe the FBI deserves a massive new headquarters or a Washington field office. Building a new headquarters would condone, reinforce, and enable the Washington field office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's nefarious behavior. Unfortunately, the effort to defund this new FBI building failed. 70 Republican members voted against it. Why are there still Republicans who are on the side of giving gifts to the FBI? I think that they are very concerned about being painted as a defund the police politician. That, yeah. that, that just doesn't play well with their what they think their base wants. Uh, but I, they need to divorce themselves from that notion because, again, there's no law enforcement that's going on at the FBI headquarters. I would argue there's not a lot of law enforcement that goes on in the field, actually. Uh, there needs to be a, a increased focus on local law enforcement, which is why I think that significant reforms to the FBI, if you don't scrap it entirely, uh, would be focused on serving their local partners and then directing resources to them instead of continuing to grow the bureaucracy and then being rewarded with brand new facilities. Right, right. We need to reprioritize local law enforcement uh, nationwide because it seems like even in cases where the local law enforcement turns down arrests or if you have local prosecutors that say, we're not going to prosecute this crime, uh, these days under the Biden administration, that's not the end of it. So in Mark Houck's case, uh, the FBI came after him and even local prosecutors to include a Soros funded prosecutor were saying, yeah, there's no nothing to go after here. Yeah, so I think that you've got a couple of combined forces here. There's a there's an ideological capture that's going on where certainly the FBI is going after its, its perceived political enemies. But there's also pressure because they have a quota system and they have to hit their numbers. And this is why they look for the low hanging fruit. And the FBI hasn't had any of those headline grabbing cases uh, that came out with. People said, wow, that's that's great job. That's good. A solid, complex investigation by the FBI. Normally, what you're seeing them is, is, is touting that they stopped some sort of serial armed robber. And then when you dig into the details, you find out that local police arrested somebody who robbed two auto repair stores in one day and it was three years ago. But the FBI came in and adopted the case and just has it in the books for a few years and then got their press release after the fact. But and they're counting on people not actually digging into the details. They don't really do the complex investigations that we expect of them, and they're represented on pop culture through TV and movies. What did you make of there was a, a this last week? There was a manhunt in central New Jersey for a January 6th suspect. They shut down an entire community in central New Jersey. They told people they needed to shelter in place. The FBI never indicated that 
uh, the, the man they were looking for was a threat to the public. They never said that out loud. They just told everybody to shelter in place. They had an overwhelming show of force, SWAT teams all over the place, helicopters in the air. Uh, it seems like a, like a pretty dramatic uh, theatrical uh, use of force that was never necessary. What's your view? I, I concur with that. Look, this is the process becoming the punishment and it's being applied to specific subjects of investigation, particularly those who are accused of committing crimes on January 6, 2021. There are a host of options that the FBI has to bring anyone into custody, and as the premier law enforcement agency for the country, they should pride themselves on doing it using the least amount of force necessary. And this is sort of the crux of one of my whistleblower disclosures that I brought forward. They were using too much force. It was presenting a risk to the public safety, to the actual FBI employees. You can call someone on the phone and say surrender. You can use local law enforcement assets. You can use uh, surveillance. And, and when the guy drives to work, maybe just pick him up when he stops off to get a cup of coffee and gas up. There's all these options at your disposal. But the default now within the FBI, especially when it comes to these politically charged cases, is send in the tactical team because no one wants to brief up to the seventh floor of the Hoover building that they did anything less than use the maximum amount of force that they could when they're dealing with these evil, vicious, violent, violent terrorists as they, they label them. How much of this force and, uh, and, and, and fear, the creation of fear here, is designed to suppress political opposition? I mean, in the, in the sense that, you know, if somebody sees this and they're conservative, they, they hold back on even expressing their views uh, in their neighborhood because they see what the FBI does to people who vote the wrong way. It has an enormous chilling effect. That that's what the FBI is all about these days. Every all their actions against these January sixth defendants, their actions against whistleblowers. It's all to prevent others from coming forward and voicing their opinion as there is their right to do as an as American citizen. And that's not in keeping with traditional law enforcement. Law enforcement is supposed to be about the process. You bring someone into into custody after you properly investigate them, and then you leave it up to the court and a jury of their peers to, to decide their fate. But now the FBI has taken on this new role where they're going to actually punish people before they have their day in court. And, and that's just outside of its purview. It's outside of its prime directive as an agency. Uh, and, and it's very disturbing here, especially when they are choosing who they're going to apply this to. Let me ask you about what's happening with some of these Democrats that the FBI has been going after lately. It's kind of interesting. And, I, and I'm, I'm so cynical that I'm skeptical of, of all of it now. Uh, but they're going after Bob Menendez. They say he has a bunch of gold bars. He had relationship with the Egyptian government, and they uh, it's just a good earnest case of stopping corruption. Uh, obviously, Bob Menendez is notoriously one of the most corrupt senators in all of Washington, so he 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 fits the description, no no question. They're also going after Eric Adams, who I should note is a pretty big time Democrat critic of the Biden administration when it comes to their border policy. Uh, and this week, we found out a lot of information about. They're now investigating him, and they've seized his devices because they want to see whether or not he accepted money from Turkey in exchange for help uh, in his election campaign to become mayor. Um, are you skeptical of the public stories when it comes to these Democrats and the pursuit by the FBI? I'm always skeptical of now is what the FBI is doing, and you just look at those particular candidates. They're not really useful to the Democrat narrative anymore. Obviously, Mayor Adams has been critical of the Biden administration's handling of, of the border, and they need to do what they can to, you know, to put, put him in the, into the penalty box on that. And, and like you said, Bob Menendez, for a long time, there have been allegations of corruption against him, and now just conveniently uh, that there's a lot of criticism against the FBI and the DOJ for sort of being a two-tiered system of justice and only going against uh, perceived conservatives, they, they, they conveniently throw this one out there. Uh, I think that they, they want to have that tit-for-tat narrative where they say, look, we're, we're equal to be applying the law. Um, but the fact that those cases have been on the books for so long, and, and it's just a very convenient time for them to drop that, always, I always have a dubious perception of it. Uh, and, and I also compare this to the, the recent leak about the anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremist label that the FBI has. Now, on its face, it looks like this is a big revelation that the FBI might be targeting conservative Americans. That term uh, was being thrown around for the last three years inside the FBI, but they've conveniently tossed it out there now to a sympathetic media source. Uh, they're going to take their lumps from Newsweek rather than shows like yours. And, uh, and, and they're going to say, look, you know, we've, we, we don't, we're going to issue a caveat. We're not going to investigate First Amendment protected activity. But again, this is out there. This is in the system. This is in the, the ecosphere. And 
it's going to have a chilling effect on people because they don't want to fall into the crosshairs of the FBI. Yeah, there's also this this kind of routine where we hear announcements from the FBI or leaks that they seem to be chasing a phantom menace of some kind that, oh, there's white nationalism all over the place and violent extremism, domestic violent extremism that we're chasing down. But we never hear reports about, you know, what what are you doing to stop the actual violence and civil unrest and uncivil unrest around the country? So you're looking at uh, Antifa violence. You look at Cop City in Atlanta, the efforts to try and stop police from building a training center there. Um, you see all of this pro Hamas violence that's taking place across the country. You just saw this week an attack on the DNC headquarters, a riot there by Democrats, anti-Israel Democrats. Um, and then this week, we also heard from FBI Director Chris Ray that he's apparently deeply concerned about the terror threats posed by all of the people pouring across our border. If that's the case, why is the uh, the investigation into January 6th the biggest one the FBI's ever conducted? Why are, why are we not actually prioritizing the real threats? Because the FBI is not about actually combating crime and bringing the numbers down. It's the human nature of working smarter and not harder. You have one case with January 6th where they can manipulate the stats and, and hit their quota figures. So we have one case with lots of subjects. Well, we're going to manipulate it to look like there's thousands of it, actually individual cases around the country. And the person didn't really do much. They've been cooperative. The evidence against them is on video, and it was them walking through the Capitol. But we can claim that's a domestic terrorist, and ergo go back and say, look, look at all the good work the FBI is doing. And here's one fact, I'll, figure I'll throw at you. Last year, the FBI had a goal, a quota of disrupting 600 domestic terrorist attacks. They fell short of that, and they only attained 397 disruptions of domestic terrorist attacks, which would mean, if you believe their numbers, that the FBI stopped a domestic terrorist attack every single day of the year and twice on Sunday. I worked inside the federal government, and they're not that good. The threat is not that high, but again, it's playing with the numbers, and, and that is not honest. That's giving, giving a false perception to the American people uh, about what the actual threat is, and they're not addressing the, the threat that we're seeing in front of us every day right. with attacks on crisis pregnancy centers and the DNC and these Hamas riots. Yeah, totally. So when you create quotas like that, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to stop this many domestic terror incidents, and but you don't have enough to justify it. How how often does the FBI just start planning terror attacks and then saying that they stop them? All the time. It's been consistently. You just look at, at any sort of narrative. It's been going on for decades. And look, counterparts on the left have been saying the same thing. The FBI traps multiple Muslim Americans after 9-11. It's always someone who is a vulnerable person. Uh, maybe not not intelligent, maybe it's English as a second language, they're lonely, they have something that the FBI is able to push and then introduce either an undercover or an informant to push someone to make an agreement to participate in something that's violent, and then the FBI cracks down on them. It's an entrapment scheme that they, is a tried and true tactic from the FBI, and now it's evolved from uh, Muslim Americans to what they're characterizing as domestic violent extremists, and now this agave label who are people who have a perception that the government might be having some overreach or it might have some negligence or might have some legitimacy issues through the electoral process. So essentially, if you think that mishandling the border or making COVID mandates uh, for public transportation or you have questions about mail-in ballots, yeah. you are perceived to be a threat and they can entrap you into a scheme. Yeah, it's kind of one of the, the effects of uh, not locking up crazy people anymore. We have no more involuntary commitments. So what happens is the FBI comes along and exploits those people and gets them involved in an entrapment scheme and then charges them with crimes. You know, it's like you get like the one idiot who's sitting around, the whole room is filled with feds and they plot out the federal kidnapping of Gretchen Whitmer, the Democrat governor of Michigan, just in time for the 2020 election. It's And, and it's amazing to me, Steve Friend, as I look at that story, that, that you still have news outlets. It shouldn't be that amazing, but they, they do it. You still have news outlets who claim that there was a real deal effort to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer and not just an FBI plot. It was a complete farce, and I actually had small involvement with it as a SWAT guy, and they told us at the time they were sophisticated, they had encrypted communications, and if they engaged with us, we were to be prepared to get into a gunfight with this organization that we thought was a violent militia. So even the, the, the folks that I, were on the ground, like myself, were taking that information in good faith. We thought that this was an actual threat. And we're, as we've come to find out, it was essentially an entrapment where they got these vulnerable guys who were not predisposed to do anything to make a couple statements and then brought the force of the United States government against them for a political narrative and October surprise.
it all it's all enough to make you really cynical and and even more so hearing from a guy like you who knows what it's like on the inside steve friend thank you very much for your time always appreciate your insight into this thank you very much man have a great one you too god bless well, here's a demented story out of a college in Tennessee. The New York Post reports that there's a Tennessee college chaplain who tried to organize a BDSM 101 workshop for students featuring a local dominatrix to discuss how to safely engage in the sexual practice, but the school quickly pulled the plug on it. How did this happen? So if, if I'm understanding just the first paragraph of this correctly, you have someone whose job it is to be a religious leader at a Tennessee college who's teaching people how to beat each other up sexually? What, I'm sorry, what is happening here? I can tell you already, this person's godless. Like, there's no way this person's a real, quote, chaplain. Students at Rhodes College in Memphis received the surprise invitation earlier this month about the workshop hosted by the Reverend Beatrix Wheel, an ordained minister and school chaplain since 2018. Oh, you see, Beatrix is a, is a woman. This is a priestess we're talking about uh, who has been a school chaplain since 2018. Chaplain Beatrix will host, this is what it says on the, uh, on the invitation. Chaplain Beatrix will host a local dominatrix to share wisdom on how to safely, sanely, and consensually learn about bondage, discipline, domination, sadism, submission, and masochism, it reads, according to the outlet. There will be an opportunity to ask questions anonymously, the November 10th invitation added to the roughly 2,000 students who attend the liberal arts college affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. The event was scheduled to take place Wednesday in the so-called Interfaith Lounge, but was canceled within hours of being posted by the chaplain. Isn't it weird that, that these schools, that Presbyterian is supposed to be a Christian school, right? They have an interfaith lounge. Shouldn't they be teaching... The, the elements of Christianity to the school, to the students, instead of, you know, having the interfaith lounge and that's where you learn how to beat each other up. That's crazy. The quote, the proposed event was canceled Friday as soon as it came to our attention, says college representative Linda Bonin. The event was not vetted through appropriate approval channels. No such event is planned for our campus. I'm looking at this picture of uh, the Reverend Beatrix Wheel this girl cannot be older than 30. She's not, I don't think she's out of her 20s. She's wearing a priest collar. It looks like she's got some sort of mockery of the Virgin Mary on her shirt. What is this? D did you say demonic? Yeah, it certainly seems like that. That's happening all over the place, isn't it? Quote, we recognize we need to do some work on our event approval processes. So we were reviewing that. We will make changes as appropriate. How about making changes to your college's chaplain, the Presbyterian Presbyterian chaplain on your campus, Chaplain Beatrix. She's been there since 2018. You didn't know she was into beating people up? Let's see here. Uh, one student called the proposed workshop absolutely ridiculous. Quote, I don't think anything sexual like that or any seminar like that should be held on a college campus, uh, the student said, telling Fox 13. Even though this is a private school and they can get away with it, I don't think that that's where that belongs. Not here, especially at Rhodes where I go. I'm not proud of it. Conservative columnist Todd Starnes reportedly slammed the idea, said that many parents, alumni, and donors were incensed with Wheel for trying to host it. A Fox 13 Facebook post about the event garnered more than 400 comments, many strongly condemning the chaplain and calling for her ouster. But others supported her, and many students didn't appear to have a problem with her idea. Honestly, it just wasn't a really big deal. No one was really talking about it, said a senior who wished to remain anonymous, told the commercial appeal. That's the name of the publication that took the quotes here. One of my friends texted me about it, and I was just like, oh, she's bringing a dominatrix. That's kind of funny. We should go. What? Doesn't this just drive you crazy? So it's it's these government-funded institutions, Presbyterian colleges. You've got priestesses teaching kids how to beat each other up in sexual situations. It may be time to disband higher education entirely. Like, maybe maybe we just get rid of all of these schools. We'll start over. The FBI and all of higher education, let's just get rid of all of it and start it once again from the ground up. And so that way we get fewer priestesses teaching kids to beat each other up. Just, just an idea.
Welcome back to the Vince Colony Show. If you survived the pandemic in the United States of America, you got to see the government at its absolute worst. You also got to see the influence that various outsiders had on the government, including the various teachers unions. They made things a lot worse, quite honestly, which was why I was reacted with um, bewilderment and some amusement at the tweet of Randy Weingarten uh, this week, the head of the American Federation of Teachers. She shared an article uh, and the headline, what's behind the increase in homeschooling? To which many Twitter users responded, uh, you, <laughs> you, that's what's happening here. Uh, for more on this, I want to bring in John Schweppe. He's the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for the American Principles Project, and he joins us on the phone. Hello, John. Hey, Vince. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, it is it is kind of amusing to me that, that Randy Weingarten is sharing articles to try and help explain why more people are homeschooling. Uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if there's ever been a more appropriate use of the, the hot dog guy. We're all trying to figure out the person who did this. <laughs> uh, but no, the, the, the reality here is that, uh, you know, with, especially because of COVID, it woke a lot of parents up to seeing that the schools aren't really doing that good of a job. Uh, you know, you have the indoctrination stuff, which obviously is a reason many conservative parents, including myself, are, are choosing homeschooling. But, you know, you also have the learning loss. You have the fact that a lot of these parents got to see behind the curtain when the digital learning was happening and, and saw their kids twiddling their thumbs, you know, scrolling TikTok because they weren't doing anything in class. And so I, I think a big part of the problem here is the, the, the racket is up, that parents are really starting to see that, that our public schools in this country are not doing a very good job at educating our kids. Yes. And uh, there are parents out there who are, there's, there's kind of a mix of things, as you're pointing out. There's the, the failure to educate the kids on the essentials, and then there's the propaganda. And I talk to, I've talked to homeschool parents who say, I had to get my kid out of the school system because they were being taught a bunch of things that our family doesn't even believe in. It's just horrifying. Uh, and um, that's a dangerous combination. And, and that's and taxpayers are paying for that. These are government schools. Well, a lot of these young kids, especially, you know, coming out of teaching college, I mean, they are motivated. I love the way Tim Scott puts it, not to teach the ABCs, but to teach the CRTs. Like mm. This is their worldview. And they really see it as important to, you know, basically separate these kids from their parents backwoods view of, of, of America. And obviously you see that stuff come across with the gender ideology. You see it with the some of the race stuff. But you're even seeing, and, and we're seeing this now on TikTok, I think lives of TikTok has posted a few things about this. I mean, these are folks advocating <laughs> against Israel and, and for Hamas and, and some crazy, crazy stuff. So, you know, again, parents are just not into that. They, they want to be able to have faith that their teachers, the vast majority of teachers are good, but as these you know, activists really start to rise up in their ranks. For sure. It hurts the entire, you know, idea of public school. Well, yeah, and it only takes one teacher to to mislead a child and, and lead to some very damaging consequences. You know, this is the, what you're talking about, critical race theory and this twisted gender ideology. And a lot of this just teach, teaches loathing, doesn't it? It teaches hatred. It teaches people to hate themselves, hate their bodies, for instance, in gender ideology. It teaches them to hate themselves perhaps because of their skin color or to think of themselves as victims of a system because of their skin color. It teaches national loathing where they have to resent America and its history. It's it's about instilling hatred in children, and that's how you destroy a country. You know, that's absolutely right. And, and you know, really what you're seeing is, is American madrasas. It's just very strange to see it pointed at America itself. But I, I just find it so revealing. A lot of folks have talked about TikTok's role and uh, pushing the pro-Hamas, pro-Al-Qaeda stuff. Yeah. Here. But I really think the schools are a big part of it because they're the, the ground that's really kind of setting this up to where kids are thinking, you know, they're not having a conversation at home with their parents about Israel. They're having it at school. And then all of a sudden, their parents find out their kids are Hamas sympathizers. And, I, you know, no wonder they're not necessarily uh, excited about sending them to public school. Yeah, I hadn't even contemplated that. What's the conversation like right now about all of these issues inside of so many schools across the country, especially in these left-wing districts? But it's not isolated to uh, just the most left-wing school districts, is it, John? No, no. I mean, this is something you, you think if you're in a red state or in a small town right now that you're safe. But a lot of these teachers, they're ideal, as I said, ideologically motivated. 
to really kind of separate kids from their parents' ideology. And so, you know, they, they believe it's their job to educate kids about, you know, the, the, the woke ideology. Maybe they aren't getting exposed to it enough at home. And, um, you know, they, they, they'll couch this in red, red state communities and conservative communities. They'll couch this in liberalism, right? It'll be all about exposing them to new ideas and that sort of thing. It won't be as authoritarian, but it's still there. And folks need to be aware of that. You know, you are not safe. If, if you're in a public school, you have woke teachers there. It's just a reality. And that's why these school board races and that's why this pressure is so important. Talk about homeschooling, if you will. Uh, you know, how, how successful is it uh, as a practice? Um, what have parents discovered, especially parents who are uh, doing it now since the pandemic? Uh, and uh, well, I've got more questions for you on this subject. But, but uh, it seems to me that you know, a lot of people are trying it for the first time. Well, you know, it depends. I know it's mixed results for some folks, but, you know, certainly the, the folks I've talked to, they're excited about how much you can do in a day. You know, I think uh, we've really kind of accepted the American school system where you have eight hours and a lot of, of, you know, idle time for the kids. And, you know, a lot of these homeschool parents are doing, okay, we're going to do 90 minutes of, of lessons and then do a field trip. And their kids are learning way more in a day than they would, you know, in the public school. So I think it's, I think it's exciting. And, you know, again, it's really important as you're raising kids to have that strong parent-kid relationship. And I think that's instilled uh, when, you, when you do homeschooling. So I, I think it's a really good thing. Now, John, uh, we're talking to John Schweppe with the American Principles Project. Anytime uh, something good begins to blossom in the United States, the left tries to figure out ways to snuff it out. Uh, so uh, how, how at risk do you think are homeschoolers and, and homeschooling parents to the left's appetites? You know, I, I can uh, easily envision, and in fact, I feel like I've seen stories where you have uh, lefties who think that parents are doing something awful by trying to homeschool their kids and need to be taken out? Well, they're going to really try to focus on the credentialing aspect and say that parents just aren't as qualified as teachers uh, to, to teach history or math or whatever. And that's obviously a bunch of bumps. You know, a lot of, a lot of kids are learning how to read at home, not really in the school, right? And so I think you know, parents need to give themselves a little bit more credit, but that is the strategy. I mean, they're going to, they're going to come up with some stories about abuse. They're going to come up with a lot of uh, backwoods religious conservatives so they can kind of demonize it. Yes. Uh, but they, they, they want to basically use their, their credentialing system to say that parents are not uh, experts in parenting. And so they shouldn't do it. Also, you know, like in my house, I, I send my kid to uh, Catholic school, but in my house, like my kid teaches me things occasionally from just stuff she's read. Like she's a, she's in fourth grade. She'll just, she'll read some random science article and then she's, she'll be telling me about it. So for parents, it's not just that parents need to know everything. They just need to you have good trusted resources they can rely on that they can share with their children so that they can learn. Yeah, I think so. And the thing about homeschoolers that we've run into is, you know, you always have that conversation after school with your kid of, Hey, what'd you learn today? Nothing. Yeah. You know, and with, with homeschool, you, you're always having conversations with your kids about That's all true. sorts of things in the world. And it's, I think it's a really good thing. That's true. And then you can reflect on those in, in real life, you know, practical applications, because now you, you were a part of that lesson. And, and that weekend, when you encounter something that has to do with it, you say, hey, remember when we were talking about this? This is exactly how it works. Or you see something in the news. Uh, it, it creates a much more holistic learning experience, I'd imagine. It does. And I think it sets kids up for going out into the real world later and being armed with a conscience, armed with, you know, uh, sincerely held beliefs to where once they do run into these woke ideas, they're able to counter them and, and you know, call a spade a spade. And yes. I think, you know, one of the things is if you're if you're sending a kindergartner to public school, they're not they're, their conscience isn't fully formed yet. It's really difficult to even ask them to do that. Uh, so that's why I think it's really important whether you're doing your private school uh, homeschool, or even if you just are making sure that your public school is teaching the right things, you got to guard those minds early. Uh, otherwise, that's that's when you lose. Yeah, and and that's another critical component here, which is the moral education. Uh, and you know, at the moment, um, it's just so unfortunate here in the United States that you have a lot of strangers who are preying on your children, and some of them, unfortunately, are in the schools. And as you stipulated earlier, we're not talking about the majority of teachers here. Majority of the teachers out there that I've met. Are people good, good, earnest people who want to educate children well? But if if you get enough in there, just a few, uh, who can really upset the apple cart and and take advantage of these children, it creates national chaos. So that moral education, what parents can instill at home, 
is critical, and it really gives the kids who go to these homeschool experiences, it, who, who stay at home to learn, uh, a real advantage, I think, in terms of just helping create the, a better country. Yeah, I think so. And again, things have changed in 20 years. You know, I was a public school kid. I, I, I remember you know, looking at homeschool families, you know, kind of with a strange eye, like, is that really like beneficial? Yeah. But, you know, I think that especially as this country becomes more divided, as you said, you know, and as you have te- some bad actors, teachers who really want to teach your kids to hate America or to identify as a, a different gender or whatever, I mean, you got to protect them. That's what this is about. That's what the parental rights movement has been about. And homeschooling is a critical component of that. Yeah. The other piece is, you know, you, I, I too looked back on homeschoolers. You know, I, I went to a variety of schools growing up being in a military family. I went to the government schools. I went to Catholic schools. I, I tried it all. My parents, every time we moved, it was something else. But um, the homeschoolers we met, I feel like I remember uh, that, one, they were typically way brighter than everybody else. Which was weird as a kid. You're like, oh, like they're out of our league. Like we couldn't even talk to some of them. It was, it was amazing. Uh, the other piece, though, is, is I kind of thought, well, this is weird. They, they spend all their time just alone with their parents, and they don't socialize as much. But that's not actually true. The, these homeschool students, um, they've got social experiences because there's, there's homeschool parents who get together, and the students do the field trips, and they do social events, and they do sports. Uh, so this is all considered and factored in, isn't it, John? Yeah, you know, obviously it's different in different areas, and there aren't the resources in some areas, but certainly here in Northern Virginia, there's all these homeschool co-ops. I mean, there's just all sorts of things to do. You you can't, you know, get enough of it. And so um, I think as this grows across the country, you're going to see more of that parents banding together, you know, even specializing, right? Like, you know, I would feel probably out of place uh, teaching science, but, you know, give me history, give me English, sure, let's do it. Um, and I, I think that's what a lot of parents are doing, too. And, it's you know, it's working. I mean, yeah. the reality is that we're, we're better at teaching our kids than we think. We should probably try to do it. John, are you hopeful about the direction of uh, education in the country? Obviously, the pandemic was a wake-up call to a lot of parents, as, as we're discussing. Um, do, you th- do you see things changing? You've got some states that are pursuing uh, school choice, allowing parents to, you know, pick up and move to a different school and bring that money with them. Uh, and then, of course, you've got homeschooling, which is definitely on the rise, um, are things headed in the right direction? Look, I think competition uh, via school choice definitely helps. I think citizen oversight of curriculum via school boards, via you know uh, state elections certainly helps. But I, I have to be honest, Vince, I mean, this is why I'm, I'm homeschooling, hoping to eventually do Catholic schooling. It's a total vote of no confidence for me in the public school system right now, just because you know of the stories we're hearing, just because of the horrible videos we're seeing on on twitter you know where you just have kids getting absolutely beat up and there's nothing no one there to support them so you know i i know that those are horror stories but i think i think that's how a lot of parents are feeling right now is you know we love our kids we don't want to put them in a horrible situation and and unfortunately public schools seem like in a lot of cases they they aren't good yeah look we'll we'll know it's all fixed when a parent can send their kid on the bus and know that the school will be flying the american flag and not a left-wing pride flag that's when that's when you'll be back to recognizing the school system. But right now, uh, it's it's crazy out there. And uh, that, that, there's honestly, I, I it's weird to say this, but they are after your kids, aren't they, John? They are. I, it's a weird ideology, but that's you know they don't have enough kids themselves, so they really have to convert ours. Good so point. that's why you got to protect it. Judge Schweppe with the American Principles Project. Thanks for always being on the right side of the fight. Good to talk to you, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, Vince. Well, another wild show on yet another wild day. Some housekeeping items for you that you should know about. Uh, First of all, if you are not subscribed to the podcast for the Vince Colony Show, please, 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 please do that. That's a big deal for us to have more and more people subscribing and downloading. uh, And uh, it it helps the show a great deal. And uh, it makes it really convenient for you. That's probably the most important thing, right? It It makes it very convenient for you to listen to anything you may have missed uh, at any time. So you can go back and listen to all of these interviews uh, and all of the discussion we have right here on the program. It's super convenient uh, in that way. So just look for the Vince Colonnais podcast anywhere you can find a podcast. Also, uh, please, I, I don't often ask for this, but just to remind people, please follow me on social media at Vince Colonnais. I've got a Twitter handle there. I try to share fun stuff, interesting stuff, breaking news. And typically you're going to get an advanced look at some of the stuff I'm going to talk about during the program because it's usually whatever I'm obsessing over during the day. And one other big thing that you should know about, this weekend at 4 o'clock, 
on Saturday, 4 p.m., you'll be able to hear from the man who is behind the scenes on this program, that is Corey and Ganimort, the producer of this show. Four o'clock Saturday, right here on WMAL, Corey is going to be hosting the full hour. And Corey is, first of all, he's just a hilarious figure, super smart, uh, and really into all the polit political stuff, knows conservative politics cold, and is just perfect on the radio. So you're going to be able to listen to him and get some deeper insight to how this show is constructed every week and uh, certainly get his takes on all of these really big stories. It was great talking to Corey yesterday about how Major League Baseball has decided that Atlanta can finally have the All-Star game. Nothing changed in Georgia, right? Nothing at all, actually. Georgia installed this new voter integrity law, and Major League Baseball called them racist for it. It turns out it's not racist at all, and now they come back and they act like nothing ever happened. But uh, Corey is among the people who's going to make sure that Major League Baseball does not forget what they did. More this weekend. Corey will be on at 4 o'clock right here on WMAL. In the meantime, the great one, Mark Levin, is up next right here on the legendary WMAL.